I hope I can share some information about the human-centered design process with you and that will help you put people at the center of your strategic problem-solving processes. So whether you're a Fortune 500 company that wants to solve uh, you know, new and great product releases, your next product release that's already out there, the next generation of that, or you're a startup starting uh, with a smaller effort trying to get out and define what your MVP release is, putting people at the center of your process is not only very important, it engages your team, and I'm here to talk a little bit about how uh, the genesis of that and a framework that can be helpful for you to think about implementing that in your organization. To talk about solving problems, it's helpful to maybe start at a more abstract level, and that's where a diagram called the squiggle by Damian Newman comes in really handy. Uh, you can talk about and diagram how, as people, we um, need to digest information to understand our current context. We process that, and we end up defining based on the information that we have. We define what it is that we, we want to solve, what the, the space that we should be working in is. And then we're more focused and directed as we then turn to craftsmen and craftswomen try to make solutions that solve those particular problems. And that's what the this squiggle is, is very useful for. And, and some main things that I uh, like to get out of this diagram and communicate to other people is that at the beginning, um, it's, it's not very clear, right? There's a lot of figuring out that we need to do. Um, so that takes a lot of patience, especially with a team. And people are, all right, let's get going. And we've got all this energy, um, but it's not a straight line, right? We all need to work together. Um, so, and it's not clear where we're going, right? But it does become more clear. Um, and it takes different skills as you move through this process. So understanding is not necessarily uh, the same group of people uh, driving the process it is that, that are people creating the solutions toward the end of the process down here. And the squiggle um, has some labels here for research to concept and then to design. And design is a word that's a very loaded term, um, but for now let's, let's think of that as crafting artifacts and designing specific things. So that is a starting point. Uh, will help us lead into talking about other frameworks that will be helpful and more specific for implementing HCD. We can build on this initial understanding or uh, framework from the squiggle. Um, now we can take a look at how IDEO, IDEO is well known as one of the pioneers in this space, and they have a couple of models. One was introduced earlier and one more recently to describe um, this general framework, and there are some methods that fit into each of these um, kind of phases of the framework that we'll talk about later as well. Um, but this initial diagram that they put out a uh, decade, maybe two ago, um, moves from concrete to abstract. So in the here phase, um, or, or step of this process or methodology, you're trying to observe, you're learning, you're understanding the pains of different people and the current situation. What are their motivations? And you're synthesizing that and summarizing it and sharing it with the rest of the team. So not everybody's going to do that work and you need to communicate it out to the rest of the team so that you can engage them in that process. Having done some initial research, you can then try to process that information, try to understand it, develop themes, translate it into things that you can actually act on, and you can create a common view for the team. So that might take the shape of different stories, um, different problem statements that then will focus the team's energy and, and generating solutions. So then you're gonna get into ideation. So it's a beacon for ideation as well. So in this model, this is where you're moving from concrete to more abstract, and then you're trying to translate that and make some things from that as well. And you're moving into deliver, which would then try to make some more concrete. You're taking the early concepts and you're deciding what you're actually gonna move forward with and make, and again, validate, put in front of customers, see what will work, what won't work, and test that out both in against a framework in theory, perhaps uh, scenarios that you've built, or in real life against uh, real users and get that in front of them for their real life feedback. More recently, IDEO has developed a model that takes into account some feedback from how people actually practice. So this idea of being expansive and then um, divergent, convergent, um, expanding your thinking and then trying to call that and synthesize that information and doing that iteratively. So, um, and I've also changed the names of these major chunks of uh, work. So here, create, deliver has now become inspiration, ideation, implementation. And uh, the dimensions here are convergent, divergent. So Initially, you're starting here to get some inspiration. You're still doing research, understanding current context, and then you're trying to develop themes, um, being divergent, then converging, finding out what you should take together from there and, and, and validate input from the team. You're also working with um, probably technical folks and business folks to understand the viability and feasibility of ideas as well, in addition, in addition to the desirability, which is primarily what human-centered design starts at and starts with, but it does include all of those things. 
And then at the end here, we're getting, um, you know, moving from divergent, getting even more convergent as things really start to get real and we're implementing specific things. IDEO's models give a couple of different representations. Um, and now, more recently, there have been some interesting uh, mashups of lean, um, um, lean UX, um, agile, and design thinking. And this model over here, which has several different sources, so I, I can't unfortunately give the proper specific attribution because several different folks have uh, provided variations on this. But I'm also trying to map it to the color coding we had earlier here, where again, you're starting with um, more concrete, you're doing some more divergent thinking, and then over here, we've kind of merged it with um, software, a software development cycle. So over here, you've got actual ideas and you're transitioning and building software, you're getting data, you're you know, synthesizing that information, you're deciding what to do with that information next, and you're fueling iterations of your product development. Um, when you get to this point, or even on one of the loops back through here, there's a smaller loop where you can take and do a technical spike, you can um, do some concepts and get feedback on that. Anything that you're, you've got some uh, risk associated with and you're not sure if it's going to be worth uh, deploying or doing a full development cycle around, you can do that as well. And it's at this point here at OpenArc, um, this transition from um, understanding, defining problems and generating conceptual solutions for them and transitioning into actually building things. This is a point where we like to, um, I guess, align and have things that fuel that development cycle. And those three main things are uh, defining the high level user experience. So not every last uh, pixel perfect design, but uh, the patterns, the types of interactions, the flows, the information architecture. Um, the technical architecture, so what's, uh, what's the technology stack, what are the integration points with existing systems, uh, what's the plan to move from the current product to the next product, if some of those are considerations. And finally, the, the backlog, so that can be user stories or epics, and prioritizing those with the product owner so that you understand what the MVP release is and potential releases beyond that um, at, at this point. So within the cone of uncertainty, what you think you know now about the first release and, and work that comes after that. I hope that overview of some different frameworks for human-centered design was helpful. Now you're probably wondering, well, how do I put that into action for my specific project? Um, and so to um, get a little bit further into conversation, we're going to talk about um, human-centered design methods and how they fit into each of those major blocks that we talked about and how you can choose those based on the needs of your particular project. So your context, your project, you're probably certain uh, amount of the way on your journey. Every product design or development effort is uh, unique. You might have some work already done. You may have some internal knowledge uh, already built up. You may have done some internal work. And some of the human-centered design methods might just fit right into there uh, on top of that and fill in gaps that you have in your current knowledge to make you more confident in developing a product that's going to be uh, useful and usable for your audience. So down here we have a library of human-centered design methods. Um, IDEO, again, is a, a pioneer in developing these, as well as others have created that you can choose from. Um, the idea would be that um, learning more about each of these methods, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into detail for each of these, but there's a um, kind of a, a methodology, a gen general methodology, a way that you would engage a team to gather information in this particular case and summarize that. Um, and to take some of those based on what you're hoping to get out of these activities, you would uh, frame a design challenge, for example. You might do some card sorting to understand how um, end users understand groupings of information and how they might navigate. Um, you might do a heuristic review if you have an existing product and you're looking for high value usability improvement opportunities. Um, so out of that, you might then synthesize that information and try to summarize that information using other techniques. One being something like journey mapping, so plotting um, different user types over time, their interactions with your product and service to understand what some of the things that are working, current pain points and opportunities might be, as well as a competitive mapping and comparison. Uh, you might create concepts based on that. You might have some statement starters. Uh, you might do some stakeholder mapping to understand relationships of people. And uh, you might um, create personas. And then finally, um, as you generate ideas and try to synthesize those even further and try to make specific things, you might do some storyboarding. Um, you might do some physical prototyping if you have physical products. Um, you might create a video scenario to try and tie all those together. And uh, you might uh, create a roadmap to define your minimal viable product and uh, some priorities moving forward for discussion with the team and to test with end users. So we've been through quite a bit um, to wrap this up and uh, to think about some of the ways that you might talk to folks or maybe questions you have for us. 
um, we are gonna go through some, um, some reasons why HCD or human-centered design is a good idea. Why would you even use it? Perhaps that would have been a good um, place to start, but without some of the context of how it's applied and some of the background, um, it would have been maybe uh, fallen deaf ears a little bit. So now we're gonna talk through some of these main, main points. Um, first and foremost, probably one of the, the central themes here is just it focuses upfront and throughout on people. Um, so you're not designing something and then testing it with people and getting feedback and hoping that it, it resonates. You're including people upfront in the process, designing around their needs, understanding what's desirable um, based on your current context that will make the um, development efforts, which are much harder to change and much more costly to change, uh, higher value. Uh, the way that um, designers generally work, um, and not that everything involved in a human-centered design process involves designers, but it's usually led by designers and design thinking, is transparent. And that really helps with team engagement, um, making things visually, having a, an, a cadence for sharing things, going, doing some work, sharing it out, iterating on it, and making it visible to the team. Um, and this engagement, um, and sometimes pulling in outside expertise and the team that you form um, helps to accelerate because you're pulling in different skills. You're, you're bringing together folks who see things from different perspectives. And uh, in, involving people throughout the process um, is a form of risk reduction. So you're not waiting until the end to, to unveil what it is that you've done. And you're not waiting to engage people at specific gates in the process. A team is interdisciplinary and you're reducing risk by including them and focusing on users throughout. And finally, um, some of the human-centered design methods that we talked about um, are fo focused on priorities. So each of those uh, divergent, convergent, um, convergent cycles um, help you prioritize and prioritize to the point where you can use that to create a roadmap that uh, you can see how those impact different roles uh, and different uh, teams within your organization to develop an MVP product and beyond. So I hope all this was helpful. I would love to get your feedback. Please use the email address below to get a hold of me. Thanks very much.